The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hi, Monica. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great. How about yourself? I'm good. And I was just going over some of our reviews and I wanted to share one of them with you. It's a little long, so I'm going to share some highlights, but I wanted to let everybody know that Pam H. writes, my heart is full of joy and gratitude for this podcast. Monica and Jennifer have boldly done what others shy away from an aspiring and educational platform that discuss the hardest of the issues around our finding balance and harmony with our planet. She goes on to share a little bit more about herself and then says they make the podcast fun. They make this process a humbling learning journey together because none of us knows it all, nor has all the solutions. Safe place to restore what is already in us and addresses the core issues without ridicule or shaming. I absolutely love that. I know, I I do too. It it actually makes me emotional. I know. So Pam, thank you so much for a thoughtful review. And for those of you enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to leave us a review. It really does help us reach new people, spread the word, and grow the biophilic movement. Pam mentions in a review that she is an ecotherapy researcher and a nature artist, as it ties in so nicely to today's episode, which is all about how our brains respond to aesthetic experiences, like looking out at a beautiful landscape or at work of art. Yeah, today we're really diving into a relatively new field called neuroaesthetics, which is the study of how we respond to beauty and why we find certain things beautiful. And, you know, I was an art history major, so this is a bit up my alley. This is so up your alley. <laughs> Our guest is Dr. Anjan Chatterjee, a professor of neurology in the Perlman School of Medicine at UPenn. His research focuses on the brain's response to beautiful environments, architecture, art, and nature. And we dive really into so many things with Dr. Chatterjee, but specifically the conversation we had was about nature, the really nuanced and really expanded my own understanding of biophilia and how it affects us. Me too. And I'm so excited to share it with all of you. So let's get to our interview with Dr. Anjan Chatterjee. Dr. Anjan, it's so good to see you again. My pleasure. It's been too long. It's been way too long, but we're so thankful to have you on today because I know how busy your schedule is. So Monica and I have been trying to get you to just join us and just share all your knowledge with us. So thanks for being here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. And reading all of your work, I'm fascinated by a lot of the language you use. And I would love to just sort of dive right in. A lot of times we ask about background, but I think if I ask this question, you can consider <laughs> how you got here, is the word neuroaesthetics. I don't think I'd ever heard that. You also use neuroarchitecture. Can you share with us a little bit about what that is and how you came to use those terms? Neuroaesthetics is the study of the biology of aesthetic experiences. We are constantly having aesthetic experiences, whether we even know it or not. Mm. From the minute you wake up, what does your bedroom look like? When you go into your bathroom, you probably, I don't mean you specifically, but everybody has a morning ritual of what they want to look like when they present themselves out into the world and so on and so forth. What clothes you wear, 
aesthetic experiences are all around us. And we want to understand what those experiences are. And the particular lens that we use to do that is thinking of this through the nervous system. How does our brain respond to the environment and how does it extract value from the environment? Is this a new form of study or a new way to speak to this this study? It's a very young field. You can go back in history and find traces of people interested in the physiology of aesthetic responses. So all the way back to Edmund Burke, who is also known as a political philosopher, was actually quite interested in aesthetic experiences and wrote about the beauty and the sublime. And a lot of his writings touched on possible physiologic underpinnings of those experiences. But the field itself in the modern era has only been around for about 20 years. And if you look at, I've done this in a few publications, looking at the number of papers that are published using search terms on PubMed, Mm. and you find really about 10 years ago is when it started to accelerate. So it's a very young field and neuroarchitecture within that is even a younger field. It's like a subset of neuroaesthetics. And were you aware of the term biophilia or maybe I should ask like when that kind of came into your lexicon, if it has at all and has that affected at all the work you've done or has it just helped build the framework? Biophilia. To my knowledge, and I, I'm not sure this is correct, you would know better than I, I think I tie it to E.O. Wilson as one of the first mm-hmm. people to at least popularize it. Yeah. I find that whenever I think someone started a term, there's always someone before that. But <laughs> yeah. so. there, there is, I think Fromm was a psychologist. He yeah. spoke about it in the psychological way, and then E.O. sort of put it into more of a hypothesis But yeah, to your point, he definitely popularized it. And so were you aware of EO through your work or is it just something you stumbled upon and and do you even use the word? Because it doesn't mean that you have to. I'm just curious where that sits with you. I was aware of Wilson's work from some of his just general writings. Not, I have never had any direct interactions with him. I think he comes out of sociobiology, which is a little bit removed from neuroscience, at least the way historically those things evolve. The term has been of interest more in the context of architecture and what that actually means. I know the term is a powerful term, but it also has some limitations. So our view is that we are fairly, how do I put this? My undergraduate degree was in philosophy, and I had a professor who said, you should read like a scavenger, which is that you go after stuff and you take what's going to be useful. I'd love that. (laughs) Right? So that's my attitude about different disciplines, which is that you go in there and you stay grounded in your own discipline, but you take what ideas are useful and can be translated or useful. So I think biophilia is one of them in thinking about how we respond. Again, the core question is, how are we responding to our environment? Mm. And one of the ways that we organize those sets of questions is how does the brain categorize the world? And one way to think about that is around people, places, and things. So in our visual system, there are different pieces, real estate pieces in the brain that are dedicated or tuned to our response to people, to places, and things. And each of those, we have aesthetic responses to them. In our work in the lab, we're interested in beauty of people and why Why do we care? Why do people respond to beauty? What are the social consequences of that? With places, it becomes both the natural and the built environment. And these environments are where our brains evolved during the Pleistocene. And this all, a lot of this happened before we had the built environment of the kind that all of us live in right now. So what are the tensions there between a brain that evolved in a much less built environment to one that is now surrounded by lights and buildings and sirens and all of the rest? And then things has to do with, could be the design of products, but we focus more on art. Why is this thing that we have just We stick things on the wall or we don't typically eat them or have sex with them. And yet we have this engagement with them. Why is that? What is that telling us about the nature of our engagement with the world and how we impose value or extract value from the world? 
That's really interesting about art. And I was an art history major, so like this is sort of really mm-hmm. interesting to me. Do you find that it is cultural? Is it universal? I mean, obviously aesthetics, some of it is learned, right? We like different things because maybe it reminds us of a positive memory. But when you walk into a museum and you're exposed to art, do you find that there's a universal, like the Mona Lisa or a Monet or something that we think of as these universally revered art or is part of that cultural we've been told it's good art so like how does that work when you see a piece and what's happening in your brain that makes you feel passionate about it you touch on kind of a core question in your aesthetics what's universal and what's culturally modulated the other thing in that is i'd like to be clear that sometimes people make the difference or try to draw a distinction between biology and culture Mm -hmm. and i think that's not a very useful or even a meaningful distinction. And the reason I say that is that culture has an influence on our biology. And the way we develop culture is partly driven by our biologic systems. Mm -hmm. Just a very clear example. So when people talk about things hardwired in the brain, there's a kind of sense that somehow this is something that we are born with and it's fixed. If you think about reading and writing, these are cultural artifacts. For the vast majority of our history, people didn't know how to read or write. And still, there are many, many people in the world who are illiterate. Mm -hmm. Yet if you look at the brain in our occipital cortex, I mentioned there are areas that are dedicated to people, places, and things. There is also something called a visual word form area. So there is a place in the brain that is specialized to take these little squiggles of lines and create meaning out of them. And that's a cultural artifact that is now hardwired in the brain if you are literate. If you're not literate, you don't have that area in the brain. So I just use that as an example to talk about how culture and biology are not working at odds with each other. They're really working together in this sense. But having gone on that big tangent, I've now forgotten (laughs) what your question was. I think you sort of answered it, but it's just sort of interesting if you, I don't know if you've ever done experiments where you put, I mean, 20 people in a room and you place a a piece of art on the wall and everybody's going to have a different reaction depending on their point of view, really, right? I mean, yes, and I I do remember the question now. Thanks. (laughs) One thing that has been observed by a variety of investigators, including our lab, is that if you ask the question of people's response, their beauty responses, Mm -hmm. people are fairly consistent with faces. People are fairly consistent with natural environments. People are very inconsistent all over the place when it comes to art. Mm -hmm. And people are kind of intermediate with architecture. And we kind of think of architecture, the built environment as a manufactured environment. And so the big picture that comes out of this is if these are natural kinds, which are places and our natural environment, generally people are more consistent. If they're manufactured, people are less consistent. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the point about being less consistent is not that it's haphazard. Part of our job is to try to understand what are the principles by which that variability comes about. Very clear and straightforward example is that the degree to which people have had some exposure to art. People who are completely art naive typically don't get why anybody cares about abstract art. Why is it Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko Mm -hmm. of any interest, right? Then you get the kind of classic response is my five-year-old could do that. And so there is something about being educated and being exposed to art that has a big influence. And one of the ways we think about this is we've talked about this as the aesthetic triad, which is that there are three large scale systems in the brain that include the sensory motor systems. So the way our sensory systems are even designed, put certain guardrails and constraints on what you can have an aesthetic experience of. The second part of the triad are our emotions and reward systems. Typically with beauty, we get pleasure from it, but there are other emotions that get involved. So if you go to a horror movie and enjoy that, and that's an aesthetic experience, there's kind of fear in there and anxiety, but in a safe space in some ways. So the emotional system is a very important one and is a classic 
when people talk about what is art good for, often people talk about its expressive nature, which is how do you express emotions? Mm -hmm. And then the third one has to do with semantics and meaning, which is what meaning do you extract from art and how do you make meaning of the world through art? That part is far more influenced by our personal backgrounds, our education, the culture we come from, whereas our responses to faces and we Broadly, most of us have very similar emotional systems. You have fear, I have fear, you have anxiety, I have anxiety. There's some debates about how those get labeled and the labeling of the same autonomic responses can be slightly different depending on cultures, even the expressions. So crying, we typically think of crying as being an expression of sadness. But people cry when they're exhilarated or they're overjoyed, right? So there's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence. But going back to your question, I think that the meaning and the semantics part of it is where there's much more variability. Uh, and that has to do with what point in time you're living 150 mm -hmm. years ago, people looked at Impressionist paintings and they wouldn't even get the light of day in the Paris salons. And now if you ask most Americans, what kind of art do you like the most? Impressionist is always at the top of the list. Yeah. Our brains haven't changed in 150 years. So. Uh, I think it's so fascinating, too, because you go so deep into that beauty connection, too. So I remember when we met a few years ago, you really talked about that beauty and how we see the world. Is the same part of our brain being used to view, like, is it beauty that we're looking at in art or is it beauty that we're looking at in nature? What are those triggers or is this the same part of the brain that we're accessing to recognize beauty? The reward systems in the brain tend to be common to all of mm. these, right? So it could be that you're eating a great meal or mm -hmm. you're anything that you are getting pleasure out of that part of the brain is being activated. And so that can be across a variety of domains. And it tells you that beauty is really tapping into a very basic system, rewards. And ultimately, we think that it is about approach behavior. Every mobile organism, right, there's one axis it's got to figure out, which is when to approach things, when to avoid things. Mm -hmm. And so we think beauty is a big motivator for that. Now, having said that, the response to beauty is just not what's happening in the reward systems. So if you say response to faces, what happens is that part of our visual system that is tuned to faces, it's the simultaneous activity of that part of the brain and the reward systems that is the experience, at least to a first approximation, the biology of the experience of beauty. Mm. Whereas if you're thinking about landscapes, it's the part of the brain that is activated when apprehending and perceiving landscapes and the pleasure simultaneously, whether mm -hmm. it's music, then you've got part of the auditory system. So I think the pleasure part is common, but what's feeding into that and feeding back to that is different depending on the content of what you're dealing with. Sure. And I think it was a TED talk that you did about how our brains decide what's beautiful. And you talked about the peacock. Can you talk about the peacock? Because I think birds are sort of interesting, right? The males typically, and I'm, I'm by no means a bird expert, but my limited understanding is that most of the males have more vibrant colors and the women are a little more drab. And a peacock is a great example. Yeah. And at least that division by sex doesn't seem to have generalized <laughs> the humans. Thank you. <laughs> but the general idea there is that these are about mating. And this takes you back to Darwinian notions and Darwinian notions of he had two broad theories, which is natural selection and sexual selection. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the whole point about both of those is that people are responding to their environment in natural selection. It's more about and I, I don't mean people, I mean, all organisms are responding to the environment mm -hmm. with natural selection. It's the natural environment with sexual selection. It's the social environment. And at the end of the day, the question is what kinds of approach behaviors lead to greater progeny? Right. So that's at the end of the day. So it could be for survival things that 
let's use the environment, for example, you've probably heard of, or people talk a lot about the Savannah hypothesis for natural landscape, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of romantic version of this. We all came out of Africa. And so that's kind of our, like our deep cultural roots. And that's fine. I think that's kind of a just so story. But the question is, what is it about the Savannah? Because you can't say that the savanna was so compelling or we would never have moved out of Africa, right? People would never <laughs> true. have left. Very true. Right? Why do people live in the Arctic, which I can't imagine why, what <laughs> tell someone as someone who loves the heat? So the question you want to ask is, what is it about that landscape? What are the properties of that landscape? Again, the kind of terms that you've probably heard, because this comes up in this kind of literature, tends to be prospect and refuge. And the third one is history. Mm -hmm. So the notion there is that prospect is an environment where you have a good view so that you know if danger is coming that, and refuge is a question of safety. And mystery has to do with this idea that there's something about the landscape that makes you want to explore it, right? That it's mm -hmm. not completely obvious. So those three things seem to be important in the context of the savanna. One thing that we try to make the argument, and this will go back to the peacock as well, it's not that someone is looking at this and logically saying, oh, I want to have prospect and refuge and a little bit of mystery, <laughs> and it becomes beautiful. It's that the people who were predisposed to find that environment beautiful because of the safety and nourishment that that place affords, they're more likely to survive than someone who found a very different kind of environment beautiful. But in the long run, across many generations, one population might fall off the cliff, literally, and not survive. So I think one thing for evolutionary arguments, and this is true for sexual selection as well, you're not going to expect an 18 year old to look at a potential partner and say, oh, she or he looks very healthy, therefore, blah, 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 right? That's <laughs> not what's going on. It's an epiphenomenon that a set of features that one might find attractive also confers greater health benefits. So I want that to be clear. And, the, and so the peacock stuff is very similar. And then with the peacock, there is this added idea that once you have a stimulus that is attractive to a viewer, each time you jack it up a little bit, and this is sometimes called the peak shift phenomenon or peak shift principle, that you get a greater response. So you respond to, let's say, big eyes, make the eyes a little bit bigger. So we use makeup to do that. Or you mm. think about anime cartoons, right? You exaggerate those mm -hmm. things, but you get more of a response. And so that's partly what's happening with the peacock. But it can get so far that so much energy is diverted to those physical features that you take a hit, a cost. And this happened, for example, with the Irish elk, where their horns, their antlers served that purpose, but they started to get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where so much of their metabolic energy was getting devoted to that, that it ended up wow. becoming at least one way in which it contributed to their extinction. Right. That's so interesting. And the peacock Fascinating. Is interesting. And I don't know if we have any idea, but do we have any sense of the evolution of the peacock, like the colors and the tail and all that stuff? Like to your point, has it gotten more and more splashy, if you will. But I think it's interesting to think of that fitness, that somehow that physicality, I don't think it's functional, right? And so it's just creates whether it was sexual excitement or whatever it is for the female, but it's interesting to see it in an animal and then see it in, I'll say men, but that's not fair because women do it too, but sort of the term peacocking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we do as a society to dress ourselves up or wear makeup or earrings or these crazy watches that men have that signify yeah. fitness, if you will, or maybe wealth, or, you know, whether that's a car yeah. or have you studied that as well? Because that's bringing in versus the physical, it's adding accoutrements like makeup to our being that are, quote, unnatural, but maybe are emphasizing or making a nod to these things. Have you studied? Yeah, we haven't studied that directly. And some of that varies culturally as well, right? There's a real adornments that we use that emphasize 
some of these natural things and our properties that we respond to. So lipstick would be an example. I make up blush for men often wearing suits with pads, or you think of all of the military uniforms that always have epaulets and kind of make the shoulders broader and the chest bigger, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. So those are all enhancing of what we typically respond to, but there are cultural ones. So I, I would say at least in our time right now, tattoos are a big thing. Yeah. yeah. And not so long ago, I mean, when I was in med school, for example, we were told that if someone comes in a tattoo, it's one of two things. Either this was from the Holocaust, and so you treated that as a completely different category of tattoos. But otherwise, it was like potential for sociopathy, that these were like bikers or hard guys, mm -hmm. you know, they had tattoos. Now, I would say in the last 15 years, I haven't interviewed a high performing graduate student or med student who doesn't have a tattoo, right? And that's within yeah. one lifetime, how dramatically that has changed. Yeah, that is fascinating because I feel like it was a small thing in college or this is back in the 80s for me, that it was like, maybe you got a small thing, you know, whatever, but it was still maybe not the nice girls had them, if you will. Right? It was subversive. Yeah, it was yes, subversive. Absolutely. And, and, absolutely. And, and now it is so mainstream, even for women to have sleeves. And mm -hmm. it is fascinating to watch the cultural change or even trends in makeup. Like Jennifer, I'm sure you can speak to this, but is it a bright red lip or is it muted or nails? Nails are fascinating right now. Mm -hmm. And I was checking in somewhere the other day and the guy at the front desk had the most fabulous nail design. And so it's trending into men now, which is sort of mm -hmm. fascinating that I was like, oh, I, you know, I'm like admiring. I want his nails. And it just <laughs> changes. But Jennifer, I don't know if you can speak to beauty trends that you've seen. Oh, absolutely. That are these enhancements, if you will, like the wings, the eyeliner wings. Little yeah. Girls yeah. Wear. That's always ebbing and flowing. And Dr. Anjan, I know you know this because you study beauty, but it's, yeah, it's, I think it's always ebbing and flowing depending on what's happening in our, our society. And, and yes, you're right. Like, and men, not only with the nails, but now men are wearing a lot more makeup and you see them in ad campaigns. And it's really fascinating to see that evolution of how we are adorning ourselves for other people to really kind of showcase our, our, our features in different ways. But yeah, I think it's a fascinating study for sure. It does come at a cost. And this is one thing we've been interested in is the conflation of aesthetic and moral values. One way to think about this is our brains are very good at discriminating objects. You can tell this is a face, this is a place, you can tell difference between different individuals, different faces, but we're pretty sloppy with our values. And so that people who are experienced as attractive, we also think of them as more intelligent, more competent, more trustworthy, more hardworking. And this has all kinds of downstream consequences, which is attractive people are hired more easily. They're given bigger pays. If they commit infractions, they're given lesser punishments. Students who are attractive, unless they are standardized tests, are typically given higher grades. And then the other consequence of that that we've been looking at in considerable detail is when people have minor facial anomalies, so mm -hmm. scars or burns or developmental defects, that other people view them and just implicitly think that they are less intelligent, less hardworking, less competent, less trustworthy. And they're not even aware of doing that. Mm -hmm. And we are inundated culturally with this message. Mm -hmm. So if you think about villains in most Bond movies or the Marvel Universe, even the Lion King, the only character that doesn't get a name is the villain and his name is his facial anomaly scar. Ah, this is the message we are giving our three and four year olds, right? So mm -hmm. from the very beginning, so there is this kind of our preoccupation with beauty does have some, Jennifer, you and I have talked about how beauty relates to wellness, but it does have this other side to it that we can't ignore the fact that there are these downstream and negative consequences. 100%, 100%. Yeah, I think so too. You see it all. I mean, I saw it, especially during the pandemic when I was sad for people because they were so upset that they couldn't get their hair colored. They were, oh my gosh, I'm like, my actual hair color is going to come through and their grays were coming out. I just saw this cascading wave of sadness or fear from women that they are afraid to have 
their roots showing and their real natural color. And I thought, are we at that place right now where we're going through a global pandemic and people are so scared to show? And then, and really then Jennifer, about. you're trying to get them out into public walking and they're saying, forget <laughs> about it. <laughs> they were not having any of it. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. But you're right. You're yeah. Right. Well, and you hear stories now of people who were especially younger people, high school students, wearing the masks, right? And then now they're sort of nerve, it sort of became a shield yeah. that now they're a little socially concerned about taking it off to show themselves again, because high school can be a very nerve wracking place. I found that really sad. I read an article, it made me sad that mask, but I get it. I get it. The girls with the hair in front of the face, you know, it's like you are trying to figure out who you are and society is pushing you to be something. And sometimes you don't even know what that is. Yeah. yeah. And the pandemic analogy, I think, or not analogy, but phenomena is interesting because there's also analogous to the, you know, your face is hidden and now you have to expose it. There's a vulnerability to that. Mm -hmm. But there's also a kind of people are so used to being inside. And Jennifer, I wonder if you have thoughts about this. It's almost like a kind of an agoraphobia. You don't want to get out there. And sometimes it feels like people are afraid to go out after having spent so much time indoors. And I, Jennifer, have you yes. that your experience? Have you I'm seeing that everywhere. So being here in New York City for two years, and it's been two years, I'm just now starting to see people that feel comfortable enough to go out and do things. And it's yeah. been, I just had my first in-person meeting in New York city a few weeks ago. And it's good. It's been two years because you're like, Oh, I'm not, I'm kind of comfortable now in my dwelling. I know I'm safe here. And I'm like, no, go outside please for your fresh air, go for a walk, take a walking meeting, whatever it is. But I'm trying to get people to feel comfortable just stepping outside of their tiny apartments, which has been very interesting to see this evolution of people being fearful now of going outdoors because, and a lot of people here are still wearing their masks as well in the street, which is fascinating. Yeah. 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 Well, and who knows what's about to happen. One question that I thought was interesting is there was a point you made about nature and how it can be relaxing and comforting. And we sort of talked about the Savannah that has these different there's different things about nature that make you comfortable depending on your vantage point. But I thought it was interesting because you talk about how we think that we want an all natural environment, right? That you're going to go into the wilderness or a jungle, but that really doesn't make you comfortable probably because of the unknown of like what's behind the corner, if you will. And so what we really want is we actually want to be sort of soothed and comforted by nature. We actually need a little bit of order and you mentioned like a clean, calm beach or manicured, even campground, that level of organization makes it a little more accessible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. People often talk about nature as undifferentiated. A common phrase that people go to is called attention restoration theory. The idea mm -hmm. is if you go out into nature, you feel restored and you feel good. And mm -hmm. I share that. I like being out in nature and I like being out in the wilderness, but nature comes in many different forms. Some of it is really scary. I mean, I've had to get airlifted out of the Canadian Rockies because there was a grizzly in the area. I've been mm -hmm. canoeing in the Okefenokee and banged into an alligator. Nature comes in many forms. And in fact, in the 17th, uh, 18th century, people thought of nature as a scary thing. And this term picturesque came around as a kind of controlled notion of nature. So what we are finding in our research is you can almost think of there's a sort of a permeability between the built and the natural environment, which is in the built environment, we seem to want to bring in more elements of nature into the built environment, but we want to have some structure into the natural environment that doesn't happen naturally, right? There has to be the touch of humans in nature for us to really feel comfortable. So that could be mm -hmm. gardens. It could be like your backyard. It could be, again, Jennifer, you take walks through Central Park, right? Mm -hmm. Gorgeous, gorgeous, natural place, but it is not nature unfettered, right? It's exactly. controlled. Nature, Super right? controlled. So Right. So I think that's the part of the point that we're trying to make, which is that some said, and it gets back to 
prospect and refuge, right? It's about mm-hmm. feeling safe in those places. And then also, what is your background? As we talked about before, if you grow up in urban North Philly and have never been outside the city, nature is a scary place mm-hmm. because nothing is familiar. You don't know what monsters lie behind mm-hmm. the bush. Trying to give this a little more texture and granularity while there is that underlying piece that, yes, that being connected to nature is a good thing. But having said that, what's the kind of nature? Who are we talking about? What's the context? That's a great point, because I think about I've heard the stories, too, like people that live. I mean, I'm from the Bronx or people grew up in Newark. We are used to hearing gunshots like I you know I've heard gunshots before. Mm-hmm. But I was also exposed to like the botanical gardens Mm -hmm. and the Bronx Zoo and like going outside the city. But if I didn't have those exposures, I'm sure I'd be in that same kind of like, oh, it's scary. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's all about context of where we're raised, how we're raised. Are we exposed to these certain places that make us less afraid? Because I do take people for walks, like you said, and some of the people that I've walked with didn't want to walk in the park because they were a little bit afraid because they've never been there before. So it was interesting to hear those voices and those conversations of what they were exposed to before. Yeah. One of the questions as we start to wrap up here, I'm curious is what are you working on right now? Like, is there a specific research project or a specific question you're looking to answer? We have projects going on in all three of these areas of our aesthetic responses to places, to people, and to things. And I can talk about each of them, but maybe I'll talk a little more about some of the work in architecture and the built environment. I mean, I'm happy to talk about any of them and we can go on for hours, but we've been interested in what the psychological responses to the environment are. And at least in our research, we're finding that there are three core components that people seem to respond to, which we've labeled coherence, fascination, and hominess. Mm. And we have some evidence to suggest that people's brains are responding to those components, even when they don't know that they are. And so just to say what those terms mean, coherence is really about the legibility of an environment. How organized does it seem? The fascination is somewhat related to complexity, but is there something intriguing about it? And is this something that makes you want to explore the space? And hominess is just what it says, which is, do you feel at home? Do you feel like you belong in that space? And these three things don't have to correlate with each other. Sometimes we can be in very nicely appointed hotels that are very organized and fascinating, but you just don't feel at home there. Mm -hmm. So those can vary. What we're doing now is trying to understand how that plays out in different contexts. One thing that in one of our studies, we found that people who are on the autism spectrum actually are not so drawn to what neurotypical people are with respect to fascination. And we think that that might have to do with that those kinds of environments are almost overstimulating for them, Mm. like too much information. So they need something a little, and they're not going to feel homey in that kind of environment. So trying to say, here are these three constructs and how do they apply in different conditions? How do they apply in different contexts? What you want in a library may be very different than in a sports stadium, Mm -hmm. right? In a sports stadium, we want excitement. You want everybody to be aroused. But in a library, you don't necessarily want that, right? You want things to be quiet, things to be relatively coherent. What that allows us to do is to have these constructs to then say, how does this work in different places? And going to your the earlier conversations about biophilia and how do you try to incorporate biophilic elements into design features, there are a couple of things There's always this tension if you do what I do, which is you're in the laboratory, you do very controlled studies, but then how do you take this out into the Mm. field? Does this have any real world applications? So there are two things we're doing right now. One is in the laboratory, the way testing is done in just about every psychology department in the US and much of Europe is you come into a sterile room where there are no distractions because you don't want distractions. People sit in front of a computer monitor and you respond to a bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Not exactly a biophilic room. It's the most sterile, (laughs) like rectangle with nothing in it, but a chair, a table, and a computer. And so much of our understanding of human psychology, which is derived from undergraduate studies, is being done in that context, 
let that sink in for a minute. Wow. So we constructed a room, which we're actually calling a biophilic room, which I don't know if since you asked if how that word enters into our work, you know, where we have a wooden desk, we have some plants, we have diffuse light, we have a carpet that one of my students hand painted into a kind of mid-level fractal pattern. We have a moss wall in there. And people are coming in and they're doing the same set of tests in the traditional sterile room and this kind of room. And just asking the question, if they're doing exactly the same thing, does being in that environment have an impact on their ability to respond cognitively? So that's one kind of experiment. Am I going to see that when I see you in two weeks? (laughs) I have to find out because I know they have to deconstruct the room for other Got testing. It. I'll find out. It might Got be. It. I was like, oh, that'd be really interesting to go because I'm going to see you in two weeks. So yeah, I cannot no, wait. But I was like, oh, that space would be really cool to see. I'll see if they can hold on to it till then. Okay. And then the other thing that we're doing is I'm involved with a group that are setting up a rehab unit in Maryland. And this is for people in recovery from drug addiction, and there might be a mental health unit. And we are working on the design of one of these refresh rooms that you may have heard about that, you know, healthcare Mm -hmm. workers have been so burnt out during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but trying to incorporate some of these features into our room for both healthcare workers and for patients So the question is, if you spend 15 minutes in this room, what impact does that have? And so we're going to try and designing the room allows us to then adjust it based on the data that we're getting. So that's in the works. It's still in the process of designing the space. It was one of these places that was a nursing home that was to open right when the pandemic started. So it never opened. And so there's a huge empty building there has been fallow for the last two years. So this is the kind of thing I think that we're we're interested in. The question being, how do we take our laboratory experiments out into the field is an important piece. The other thing that I always, uh, when I give talks to designers and architects, is I try to challenge them. I say, what you're really doing is making a prediction into the future. Because what you're saying is I'm going to have these design elements and I know I am predicting what people's experience is going to be in those spaces, Uh right? Well, how do you know that you're right? Yeah. You might be brilliant and maybe you are right, (laughs) but how do we know? What if you're not? Yeah. Right. And so my big push to them is is that there's so much thought given up front into the design Mm -hmm but very little actual data collection after it's done. And maybe people don't want to know. So this is a core principle in neuroscience that is prominent right now. It's called the prediction error model of learning, Mm -hmm. which is that we have models of the world. And as input comes in, those models get updated, right? Mm -hmm. Either the model is accurate. So a simple example, you're walking along, we're taking a walk with Jennifer and out of the corner of her eye, something is moving. And first you think, oh, it's an animal. But then when you look at it, it, no, it's just a leaf that's moving around. But when you think it's an animal, because you need to be careful, you have a model of the world that then gets corrected when you look at what it actually is. Hmm. And some of the neurochemistry of that has been worked out, but that's the way we update the world and get better and better about learning our environment. And so my push to designers and architects is you're not using a prediction model because once you've done it, you're not asking yourself, how close did we get to what we thought would happen as a means to then learn how to do it the next time. I'm a scientist, love data, collect data. Let's see if your your ideas are right. They probably are, but let's find out. And can you tweak it better for future designs? It's fascinating. No, it's super interesting. And I think about the built environment and where I live at this place called Serenby, you know, we're always building houses and Mm -hmm. the founder is, has this very specific vision. I think he very much, pulls from the past from an architectural Mm -hmm. and then implements that whether that is integrating sidewalks or certain architecture is diverse it's not just cookie cutter but i'm thinking more of the interiors where 
let's say brass right now is like a few years on has been like the thing. And so our data, nobody's doing a study, but if you will, the buyers, because they're continuing to purchase, right? Mm -hmm. That's your feedback loop, if Mm -hmm. you will, of do they want farmhouse chic, modern, Mm -hmm. a tutor, and then whatever these design elements are, I want millennial, you know, millennial pink was a big thing for a minute. These, even these color trends, Right. So it's interesting to think about that. And and I do think the work of like Keller and now Bill Browning with the biophilic patterns and more people are doing classes, that starts to give a framework for these architects and designers of it that they probably didn't have in the past. Is that something that you've sort of considered that there are these teachings now that can go, you know, deeper teachings that can go into the inputs on the front end that might then get the results we're looking for? Yeah, I think so. My sense is that there is within architecture a growing interest in neuroscience. And I've been in different conversations with architects on panels about this. I think the interest is mostly from that direction to neuroscience. There are relatively few neuroscientists interested in the other direction. But I think these ideas, biophilia is a good example. We haven't talked about light and circadian rhythm that typically we might not think of as a bio thing. I would say sound. We mm-hmm. don't pay much attention to sound at all of our auditory environment. But I think architects, at least in some academic circles, are more interested. I've been involved in a couple of projects that did involve architects, one that fell through from the pandemic. It was going to be great. This was for, <laughs> for a residential place with people with short-term memory problems. And I so remember you talking time. about that, by the way, in like 2018, you t- we were talking about, what's that, 20, 2019, you're telling, telling yeah, me about that. Yeah, right. And that was when we were really excited. It was going full steam and then the whole thing crashed and burned with uh, the of investments and the pandemic yeah. and all that. But again, I think that's a situation where architects were interested in what we had to say. I mean, I'm always clear when I talk to people that I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer. This is not about territoriality. <laughs> yes. Uh, but but it is about collaboration. And maybe I bring things to the table you're not thinking about and vice versa. And some architects are more open to that and others like think that it is so much of, an, uh, of a craft and an art that science has nothing to contribute. I go back to your quote, read like a scavenger, you know, Mm -hmm. whoever, if we can bring more disciplines in, we're going to learn and hopefully have a better solution and output. Yeah. This has been so wonderful. I would love to continue talking. I know, me too. (laughs) But I thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you, doctor. Sure. That's a lot of fun. I'll see you in two weeks. Sure. I Monica, can't wait. Come up, please do. Yeah, definitely. I'll be up in New York this summer at some point. Thank you so much. Take care. What a great conversation. I feel like we touched on so many things that we could have talked about for hours and hours. And maybe I say that about a lot of our guests, but it's really true. Exactly. I know. I absolutely love this conversation. One thing that struck me right off the bat was something we talked about towards the end of the conversation about how there's a real need to study the effect of the built environment once people are actually using them day to day. These biophilic buildings really need that kind of focus. And I think it's a hard time to find the funding sometimes. We were talking with the Biophilic Institute. We had a board meeting recently and Bill Browning mentioned that post-occupancy studies are a great need in the field, but sometimes it's hard to fund them. So it's interesting to hear consensus from somebody in neuroscience that they also want that to happen at the same time. And so thinking about how people instinctively understand that you're feeling better in these spaces, but how do we prove the value to the financial markets and the developers? I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that's so true. And that's fascinating. And that makes me think about what Dr. Anjan had to say about the differences and what individuals find beautiful. So in a biophilic building, for example, you work to find that balance between natural elements that have these purported effects and a structure that serves its function. But the things that the people are drawn to can vary from person to person, especially when we start talking about neuroatypical people versus neurotypical people. Exactly. And, you know, it's a double edged sword sometimes because I can't help thinking that having more data and research would lead to more biophilic buildings. 
but we don't you have that data yet. So how do we, it's sort of chicken and egg. And so I think if we're scientifically proving the value versus just inherently understanding it or believing that it's important, it's something that's really going to help everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Everything you're saying is so spot on. <laughs> I also was really struck by the idea that we like our built environments to have elements of nature and we like our natural environments to have some degree of structure. I think that's what we were referring to earlier when you said in the conversation around nuanced understanding of biophilia. Yeah, that's exactly right. I do think people tend to talk about nature as undifferentiated, ourselves included, but it's important to recognize that that when I go walking in the woods, I'm going to be more comfortable on a trail, something that's a little more organized, or if I go to the beach, I want to want to go on a sunny day. If I'm going during a storm or even possibly high tide, I may not have as much comfort and safety by that. So thinking about nature in a bunch of different levels and scales We're really about getting outside and connecting with nature, but the conditions have to be safe with some sort of, I guess, predictability. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And that kind of opens up a whole other can of worms. We won't even get into that right now, but it reminds me of our conversation a few weeks ago with Dr. Judith Hirwagen on how climate change really threatens this relationship we cherish with a calm, natural world. Yeah, exactly. So we definitely need to put it out there that there should be more funding for post-occupancy studies, and we'll continue to do our part to protect the planet. It is Earth Month after all. It certainly is. Okay, Monica, we'll talk to you later. Bye, Jennifer. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the biophilic movement. 